today we're going to start a journey that millions of Hebrews and Christians have taken over the last 3,000 years. We're going to study the Torah, which is the first section. It's the oldest section of the original Hebrew Bible. Now, Torah is a word that few Christians have heard of, although more and more today, and I'm glad to see it, but most have any idea what it actually is. The Torah is the Hebrew name for the first five books of our Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. We're going to start with Genesis 1-1. We're going to go right on through, through Deuteronomy 34. We're going to do something a little bit different, though. We're going to add back in the Jewishness that has been removed over the last 1900 years. Why would we do that? Because it's within the Hebrew Jewish culture that and, and its language that the Torah was created. And it's only within that context that we gain proper understanding of what God's telling us. In fact, the entire Bible, Old Testament and New, was written by Hebrews. Hebrews who were entirely immersed in the Hebrew culture. It was Moses, a Hebrew, who received the Torah from God on Mount Sinai, around 1400 B.C. Now, though we typically think of Moses receiving only those two stone tablets of the Ten Commandments from God while leading the Israelites out of their bondage in Egypt, in fact, the Ten Commandments were just a tiny piece of all that Moses received during those several trips that he made up and down that mountain. Moses actually received most of what is now the first five books of what we call the Old Testament. Now, Torah is not a word you're going to find in our modern English Bibles. And it is a tragedy that that's the case. In general, where in the ancient texts, the word, the Hebrew word Torah appeared, you'll find today the word law. And this is a sad, it's a somewhat, I think, intentional mistranslation. And this first happened when the scriptures were translated to Greek, and it was fostered by the desire of the early church to distance itself from the Jewish people. Torah does not mean law. In an overly simplistic sense, it means teaching. Yet in a curious irony, even the Jews themselves have begun to adopt the view that the Torah was law, and then began applying that term Torah to all manner of religious writings to the point that Judaism in general has become a religion based more on the doctrines of men than on the Word of God. Now let me explain what has happened to the rather sloppy habit of applying the word Torah to any and every writing that refers to Holy Scripture by beginning with an analogy. Over a hundred years ago, a company in Atlanta, Georgia, wanted to join the new and growing market for flavored but non-alcoholic beverages. Instead of hard liquor, they formulated a tasty addition to the soft drink market. It was called Coca-Cola. And it was a hit. And although originally marketed as a stimulant, its real niche was simply as a great tasting beverage. And as the U.S. began to enter a period of remarkable growth and prosperity, demand for Coca-Cola skyrocketed and the rest, they say, is history. Now, Coca-Cola so dominated the soft drink market that a curious thing happened. It garnered a nickname, Coke. And even more appropriate for our purposes, is that Coke became so dominant that Coke no longer simply meant a specific brand of cola drink. It came to be a name applied generically to all soft drinks. Common conversation you might have had uh, and found yourself engaged in sounds something like this. <laughs> 
Husband, I'm thirsty. Let's stop and get a Coke. Wife, okay, sounds good to me. Husband, good. What type of Coke would you like? Wife, I'd like a root beer, please. Does that sound familiar to you? Now, any American would perfectly understand that dialogue and not find it particularly odd. We all know full well that a Coca-Cola and a root beer are not the same thing. But we also know that Coke in our modern vernacular can mean pretty much any soft drink, and so there's no trouble getting that meaning across. Torah is the same way. Originally, the Hebrews called the first bo five books given to Moses Torah. As centuries passed, two other groups of Hebrew writings were created and deemed to be of God, inspired, and therefore Scripture, the prophets and the writings. And the prophets are books like Amos and Ezekiel and Isaiah and Jonah. The writings included a variety of books, like the Song of Songs, uh, Ecclesiastes, Psalms, Ruth. And even though the Hebrews now had three separately defined groups of scriptures, Ketuvim, meaning writings, Nevaim, meaning prophets, and Torah, that which was given to Moses on Mount Sinai, in common everyday conversation, at some point, they began referring to any of the Holy Scriptures as Torah. So the original Torah from Moses was Torah, and all the newer Scripture also generically became referred to as Torah, and that's not all that hard to understand. But wait, it gets more complicated. During that same time that the Torah, the Ketuvim, and the Nevaim were created and being added to another set of authoritative religious thought was being created. And this at first was called tradition. Now, it was also known as oral law, or oral tradition, or oral Torah. Oral because rather than being written down for a long time, it was handed down verbally. And in common day Christianese, we could equate church doctrine with Hebrew tradition. It's the same sort of thing. In other words, doctrine is not scripture, it's our denominational beliefs and rulings and interpretations of scripture. It's the same idea with Hebrew tradition. So as time rolled along, the Hebrew doctrine, these oral traditions and oral Torah, started carrying more and more weight among the religious leaders. And eventually, in common conversation among Jews, Torah came to mean anything that had to do with the entire body of Scripture and the entire body of traditions. A rather unfortunate blurring of the original meaning, for sure. The Hebrews of Christ's day, and those of hundreds of years earlier, well understood what each other meant when they discussed Torah among themselves. They knew by the context of the conversation when Torah meant the original scriptures given to Moses, when it meant maybe some other religious writings, rulings. And fortunately, we can't overlook the fact that by Christ's day, traditions had become more important than God's Word. Later, as Gentiles entered the picture following Christ's death, these same Gentiles who were ignorant of the intricacies of Jewish culture and Hebrew language got confused about Torah. And even though Bible scholars have somewhat straightened it out over the years, church leaders and teachers have been pretty slow to pick it up. So today, what Christians call the Old Testament Jews call the Tanakh. Tanakh is an invented word. It takes the T from Torah, the N from Nephaim, the K from Ketuvim, you add a couple of vowel sounds, and presto, Tanakh. 
And the Tanakh and the Old Testament are exactly the same thing, except in some cases the books are arranged in slightly different order. Now, over the centuries, the traditions that had been handed down by word of mouth were eventually formalized and they were written down. And although these thoughts and rulings of the ancient rabbis are still held in the greatest esteem, this body of thought is constantly undergoing additions. And the best way to think of all these traditions is as commentary by religious leaders. Commentary that does consist of rulings as well as teachings. The fully compiled works of tradition or oral Torah became what is now called the Talmud. But the first published work of Hebrew law and tradition was called the Mishnah. And to further complicate matters, there are two major competing versions of the Talmud. The Babylonian Talmud and the Jerusalem Talmud. And each is an enormous work that comprises a number of volumes. So let's be clear. The Tanakh, which is sometimes called the Hebrew Bible, is simply another name for our Old Testament. The Torah is but the first five books of the Tanakh, first five books of the Old Testament. The Talmud is not Holy Scripture at all. Rather, it's a huge gathering of Jewish religious commentary and rulings. Now, one of the curious conditions of modern Christianity is that the Old Testament has been all but forgotten. And the common statement from a good part of the church today is, well, we're a New Testament church. In other words, the implication is the Old Testament's not for us, it's for another people, namely the Jews. Or it's just for a past time, or in seminary talk, it's for a past dispensation. So the relationship set up between the Old Testament and the New Testament is, Old Testament is obsolete, it's interesting, but irrelevant history. The New Testament is current and contemporary, but nothing can be further from the truth. First of all, the title Old Testament is purely man-made. And it is a relatively modern title given to that portion of the Bible. There is no such thing as the Old Testament as far as the Bible is concerned. The words Old Testament never appear in the Bible. The idea behind the names of what we've come to think of as the two halves of the Bible is that the Old Testament refers to the covenants made between God and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Moses. And the New Testament refers to the covenants made between God and mankind in general through Christ. So if one is inclined to think that way, it would be better to think of the biblical division as earlier and later testament, testaments rather than old and new. And by the way, testaments mean covenants. It's, they're synonymous terms. Now you see, the newer ones have not replaced the original covenants, but some have been transformed. Even Christ himself, when he was asked if the law, the Torah, was now null and void upon his coming, he answered it in about as forceful and plain a way as anybody could imagine. In Matthew 5, 17 through 19, we hear this. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappears, not the smallest letter, not the stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches this, these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Christ did not come to do away with, to abolish the Torah. He came to complete it. Not in the sense of complete as to finish 
and finish in the sense of end. In your Bibles, probably fulfill is the word that's used instead of complete. The Greek word used here is the word pleru. Now you can go to any good concordance when you go home this afternoon, and it will tell you it means to fill up, to accomplish. But in our modern English vernacular, fulfill gives the sense of something that's ended. Rather, the true meaning of fulfill is to fill full or fill up. Playru would be a very good word to tell the attendant at the gas station if there were such things anymore. Because it has the sense of fill her up. Christ came to fill full the Torah of meaning or bring it to its greatest extent. When you ask the gas attendant to fill up to your fill up your tank, you certainly don't mean to bring your tank or your gasoline to an end, do you? You mean give me all you can. Give me everything it'll hold. That gives you the idea of what the word pleru means. Now, the two testaments, earlier and later, Old Testament and New Testament, they work together. You can't separate them, as been attempted for centuries. The Old Testament is the foundation of the Bible. The Old Testament sets the stage for the New. The Old Testament lays down all the premises from which we can understand the New Testament. It's the Bible, Act 1. The New Testament is formed based on the Old Testament. It is a continuation of the Old Testament. It's Bible, Act 2. In fact, about 50% of the statements we find in the New Testament are the Old Testament. They are completely intertwined. It's pretty tough to read any book see any play, and watch any movie if you come in in the middle. We may well get something out of it, but we're just as likely to take the part that we see in the wrong context and come to conclusions that are several degrees off course. That's what we do when we attempt to understand the Bible by beginning with and not going beyond the New Testament. But I want to tell you something that you might have never considered. The Bible that Jesus and then the early disciples and then the gospel writers, Paul and even John the Revelator, studied and taught from was what we call the Old Testament. I want you to let that sink in for a moment. There was no New Testament when any writer of the Bible was alive. The only Bible that existed for all these men and for Christ was the Hebrew Tanakh, our Old Testament. The admonition that we get in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, was specifically referring to the Hebrew Bible. There was no such thing as a New Testament in that era. And while I have no problem at all in accepting the New Testament as wholly inspired of God, entirely belonging in our Bibles, of course, that statement from Paul to Timothy was in no way referring to something that didn't even exist and wouldn't for another hundred years or more. It was not meant as a prophecy. Paul was not speaking of a future time. He was speaking about the Torah, the writings, and the prophets. Paul had no idea that several decades after his death there would indeed be additional writings added to the holy canon of the Bible, some of which would be his writings that we now call the New Testament. In fact, this will hurt your head, in its most correct application, and it would help us when reading the New Testament if we could just grasp this. Biblically speaking, 
the word scripture or holy scripture only refers to what we call the Old Testament. The only scripture that exists today is the Old Testament. The New Testament, inspired and of God, is just that, the New Testament. We would gain far more understanding of the Bible if we could dispense with the term Old Testament and just call it what Jesus and all the disciples called it, the scriptures. So by all rights, our modern Bibles consist of two portions, the scriptures and the New Testament. Now I hope this makes an impact on you. While it's been the mode of the church for centuries upon centuries to imply, if not outright, state that the Old Testament is of no value to a modern believer, that the Old Testament principles no longer apply since the advent of Christ, it was the Old Testament that the original group of 12 disciples of Christ taught from. It was what Paul carried under his arm everywhere he went. It was what the apostles taught the gospel message from. And that is because the gospel message is an Old Testament message. That's right. The complete gospel is spoken of in the Old Testament. Jesus didn't write a new gospel. He fulfilled that which was previously written about by the writers of the Old Testament. Listen to what Jesus says in John 5, 46 to 47. For if you believed Moses, then you would believe me. For he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how are you going to believe my words? Hmm. What do you think that says to the church? If you do not believe Moses' writings, how are you going to believe my words, says our Messiah? Saying, if you believed Moses, was actually just a common way of speaking in that day. It was an idiom. What it really meant was, if you believed the Torah. Moses, the law, and the Torah were all interchangeable terms to the Jewish people. But the point is that Jesus says, he, Moses, wrote of me. Even more, Christ was explaining that if we don't believe or even know what Moses wrote, and it was Moses who wrote the Torah, how are we to comprehend what he's saying, what Christ is saying? See, the Old Testament and the Torah that, that we'll study are full of references to the coming Messiah and the spiritual principles that he will bring to their highest level of significance. I'm going to point this out as we come across them, and I'm going to connect the dots. Now, as the Old Testament is the foundation of the New, the Torah is the foundation of the entire Bible. Even someone who has never studied the Bible is aware that Genesis is the story of beginnings of God creating the world. How do we study anything, let alone trying to comprehend God, if we don't begin at the beginning? And that's just what we're going to do. We're going to begin at the beginning. Now first I want to set up a few ground rules. That is, this is the basis on which our study of Torah is going to proceed. Now first, I'll tell you straight up front, I am not here to persuade anyone about the truth of the Holy Scripture. While seekers are most welcome here, this is not a seekers fellowship, whereby we attempt to show that the Bible is the Word of God. We begin with the assumption that it is God's Word and that it is true, all of it. If the Bible's not true, we might as well all pack up and go home because we're just wasting our time listening to me. Therefore, I have no intention of justifying the Holy Scriptures by offering scientific proofs about God creating the world. Science is utterly inferior to God. I'm not going to explain that maybe a huge frozen comet brought all the water necessary to create the oceans. 
or why the Bible doesn't mention dinosaurs or whether the Big Bang Theory is correct. In other words, this is not a class on creation theory. I may touch on this, incorporating some interesting facts, but only by way of explanation, not trying to prove anything. Here's my position. God created everything from nothing. He did it exactly the way He wanted to do it, and He's fully able to do so. That's where we begin. If that's not where you are, this is not for you. Second, we're going to read every single word of the Torah. Every one. We're not going to skip anything. Not a single verse. And let me tell you, some of it gets pretty dicey. That's why it gets skipped a lot. I will read the verses out loud. And I will ask you to follow along diligently in your Bibles. These lessons as I explained earlier, being recorded. And since the Holy Scripture is what this is all about, I need to be sure it can be heard on the recording. We're going to move pretty rapidly sometimes. Other times we're going to go a lot slower. At some points we're going to stop and actually have a lesson that could last the entire hour on a specific topic, such as when we talk about the menorah. Or the tabernacle, or a couple of other things that are of vital importance because of the times which we are in, yet are rarely ever visited in the modern church. This is an extremely in depth study that I promise you is going to challenge your thinking, but it will build your faith. And third, I will read mostly out of the complete Jewish Bible. Now, one reason for this it is not. The official Bible translation for any denomination that I'm aware of. And that's intentional. This is not about teaching you denominational traditions and doctrines. Whether your background is Catholic, Baptist, Pentecostal, Methodist, Lutheran, Jewish, you're going to find common ground here. Let me be perfectly clear you do not have to have this same Bible. In order to do just fine in this class, in this congregation, in this fellowship. Any competent standard version you have is good. However, the words may be slightly different, particularly because many of the names of people and places in the Bible I'm going to read from will give the actual original Hebrew name rather than the name in English. And this may also sound slightly different than your version because the complete Jewish Bible is taken from the Hebrew texts. Many translations today are taken from the Septuagint, which is a Greek translation of the Hebrew done actually two centuries or a little more before Christ was born. If you prefer, you can see me afterwards and I'll tell you how you can get the same Bible I'm reading from. But let me stress, it's not necessary. That said, if you do not have this Bible version, and you got 25 or 30 bucks to get one, I think you're going to find it a pretty good addition to your study materials. Now, fourth, at times I'm going to show you certain words in Hebrew that we need to examine because they add a great deal to our understanding. Now, oftentimes I've found that looking at the Hebrew is like going from a black and white TV, which I'm sure our children in here have no idea what that is. From black and white TV to color. What you see in black and white certainly isn't wrong. It just doesn't give you the depth that full color does. What you're going to soon learn here is that Hebrew has certain words, many words, that don't have nice, neat English equivalents. The word Torah is itself a good example of that, as is the common Hebrew expression, probably everybody here knows, Shalom. But those are just the tip of the iceberg. The other thing to realize is that just as important as Many Hebrew words in the scripture do not have a good English equivalent. They also don't have a good Greek equivalent. So when the Bible was translated, 
from Hebrew to Greek, and then from Greek to Latin, and then from Latin to English, a lot of depth and understanding was lost. And we're going to do our best to try and recover some of that depth. And fifth, my goal is that we have continuity. Now, when studied properly, the Old Testament flows like a beautiful river. And too often, the Old Testament is presented as a series of interesting stories, and it can be hard to put together. Actually, the Old Testament is very much, although not entirely, in chronological order. And if I can make a generalization, a good way to look at the Old Testament is as God presenting Himself to us, but He's doing it through the history of Israel. I want to say that again. The Old Testament is very much a history lesson. It's a history of Israel. It's the history of the Jews. And it is our Christian history because it was out of the, Jew, out of the Jewish Hebrew Bible, culture, and religion that Christianity came. Remember, I want to tell you sometimes when I say this, it shocks people. Christ was a Jew. He was born to Jewish parents. He was raised in the Jewish Holy Lands. He was an observant Jew in every way. Most of the great stories and events about Christ in the New Testament occur during the required pilgrimages to Jerusalem for every Jewish male as called out by the laws of Moses. And naturally, Christ obeyed that. Even the first several thousand believers of Jesus as Lord and Savior were all Jews. And sixth, we need to understand that the Torah is first and primarily a manual for living the redeemed life that God intended for mankind. The three million or so Israelites that Moses was leading through the desert wilderness to the promised land had come from four centuries of life. Where? In Egypt. They were a rabble that had thoroughly opted for the ways of the Egyptians. By giving Moses the Torah, God explained to Israel the beginning of everything. Who he was, why the world had arrived at the corrupt place it had, and how to live a righteous life. What's a righteous life? It's you, it's me, living in harmony with God. None of these things have changed. Now, seventh, the Torah, as is all of the Bible, literal. It means what it says, it says what it means, but now let me explain what literal means when we're dealing with the Bible. Just as in our own conversations, at times we all use idioms or sayings or puns that only those in our common culture can even understand. I like to use the example, explaining this, of go fly a kite. Now, all Americans know what that means. Although I have to admit, I asked my 13-year-old granddaughter and she had no clue what I was talking about. It means basically, no, I'm not doing that. Further, it can mean I have no interest at all in what you're proposing. And perhaps even you're questioning somebody's sanity. But if I respond with go fly a kite to a Frenchman, to a Brazilian, they'll be pretty perplexed with that answer. It doesn't make any sense to them. What does kite flying have to do with anything you just asked me about? It's the same way with many, many biblical Hebrew words and phrases. They carried a perfectly clear meaning at one time. But to our 21st, century's, 21st century ears, sometimes it just doesn't compute. So literal does not necessarily mean word for word. If we took go fly a kite word for word, we'd be in trouble. Literal, therefore, means the literal meaning intended within the context 
of the culture in which it was created. And in the case of the Bible, the culture was Hebrew. And you know what? That culture changed. And it evolved dramatically over the 1500 years or more that the writings of the Bible occurred. That is to say, the Hebrew culture at the time of Abraham bore no resemblance to Hebrew culture at the time of Moses. And that bore no resemblance to the Hebrew culture in the time of Christ. And most often, the literal meaning in the Bible is word for word. But the trick is, you have to understand the Hebrew culture and all the various eras of the Bible to understand what's being communicated. And of course, there is a certain amount of symbolism in the Bible. And there's poetry. And there is straightforward history. And then there's parables. And there's several other literary devices as well. But symbolism is generally pretty easy to identify. But here's what I'm getting at. Modern Gentile Christianity has tended to treat much of the really hard to understand parts of the Old Testament as just allegorical statements. But they're not allegory at all. There is a little bit allegory, little, in the Old Testament, very little. And I'll identify it when we come across it. Generally speaking, the problem has been a total misunderstanding of what's been said. And that's due to a reluctance to research and study ancient Hebrew culture. Rather, there's been a not-so-subtle attempt over the centuries to kind of twist and turn the Bible into something that agrees with some preconceived denominational doctrine. We're not going to do that here. Now, one other thing about being literal. Many phrases in the Bible are both literal and symbolic simultaneously. That is, they mean exactly what they say. And yet, on another level, level there's also symbolic of something larger than itself. And you're going to find this radical, uh, rather inscrutable duality occurring especially within biblical prophecies because many prophecies happen and then they happen again. Rather than going into examples, I'm going to, I will point some of these out to you as we progress. An eighth, we will not answer every question you have about God. There are many matters in the Bible that are simply left open-ended. Some matters are not addressed at all, others are incomplete. A very good example is the work of the Holy Spirit, in Hebrew the Ruach HaKodesh. The Holy Spirit is mentioned, very matter-of-factly, a number of times in the Old Testament. But there's very little information about Him that's given to us. Much of what we think we know about the Holy Spirit are men's assumptions. They are conclusions drawn from what little biblical information that does exist about that subject. This is what I term doctrine. That's my definition of the term. Now, I choose to let these kinds of mysteries remain mysteries. All at times we're going to speculate, but it will be presented as speculation or my opinion, not absolute truth. Sometimes the speculation will be in the form of what the great Hebrew sages of ancient times thought about a particular subject. In fact, I'll incorporate that kind of information on many occasions. Because if nothing else, it explains how the Hebrew mind operated in certain eras. Now, I want you to get ready from, for one of the most intense, exciting rides of your life. A man in his 70s who had been coming to this fellowship regularly for a long time, a man who was a long-time Christian and a former missionary, told me very recently that he learned more about who God is in the last few months than at any time in his life. Now, what you're going to get from all this is up to you. I hope you commit the coming journey you have in studying God's Torah to a lot of prayer. 
and to personal dedication. I think you're going to find it life-changing. And next week, we will start with Genesis 1-1. Please rise. Thank you.